planet in this sleep around here? What's all the racket? Uh, what's up? Chuck! I was only kidding. Yeah! Gruesome, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> of course you know this means war. Air Jordan and Air Jordan. What'd you expect? Am my fight? of fans. Chicago was a city in need of a hero. Michael Jordan fulfilled that role and then some. Michael Jordan. He makes the impossible look ordinary. Four. Michael Strip got it back. Three. Two. Michael falls. Fires. Yeah! Oh! Does it again! The ball's wet. He looks at the crowd. The inbound pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Good! The ball's winning! You look at him every big game, every big moment. No matter if he has a flu or anything, he's going to deliver. Out of two, out of one. Here's Jordan. Yes! It is all over. The Chicago Bulls have won at the buzzer. A courageous, classic performance by the flu-ridden Michael Jordan. Jordan a drive. 17 seconds from game seven. Or from championship number six. Good. Open. Chicago with the lead. Fires. The Bulls lead 87 86. Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move by Jordan. Rep, 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 People don't understand it's not his jumping or his jump shot or his defense it's his inner guts and his inner heart you're gonna have to cut Michael Jordan's heart out to beat him there's something compelling about this guy so likable so beautiful to watch and yet with the athletic heart of an assassin and just look right through you the look that he had, it was like, whatever you do, whatever you say, we're gonna beat you. And once you get him like that, all you can do is move aside because there's no stopping his freight train. He's like a pit bull. If you look at a pit bull in the eye, he takes that as a challenge and he's gonna bite you. The best way to play Michael Jordan is start looking this way, this way. You don't never make eye contact with him because then he's gonna go out and beat you. Brooklyn on February 17, 1963, Michael Jordan was the fourth of five children. When he was still an infant, his father James and mother Dolores moved the family back to their native North Carolina, where they eventually built a home in the seaside town of Wilmington. As a kid, he watched Roots 
and sort of had a vague idea of what the whites did to the blacks in our country. And I think that he said he got a little angry, but his parents wouldn't let him carry it very far. It's, you know, be better than that, rise above it. He would watch his father working around the house, and his father would have his tongue sticking out while he was working. And whenever Michael would go to work, he'd have his tongue sticking out too. He kind of is the one that kept things going, you know, constantly uh, energetic, moving, involved, always involved in sports, always involved in activity. I'd say mischievous would be the best word to describe him. He always had a natural born desire to outdo all comers, especially his older brother, Larry. I grew up playing against my brother, and that's the best way that you can learn competition. And once you feel like you can beat your brother, you can beat anybody. He just was determined that he was going to win. And once he started to beat Larry, then, well... <laughs> but Jordan's secure sense of his athletic self was severely challenged during his sophomore year at Laney High School. He failed to make the varsity basketball team. He was only probably 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, he was the best sophomore that we had but at the time we really did not need a guard he says i looked at the list and i went down it i went past the jays and i wasn't there and i went back up again and i wasn't there he says and i ran home and my mom was at work there was no one at home and i went to my room and i closed the door and i cried so hard I would venture that that was the first time that Mike had ever been told he was not good enough to make a team and it was tough but being a competitor that he has something to prove Jordan accepted the challenge and starred for the JV. The next year, he stood at 6'3 and joined the varsity. By the end of the 1980 season, Jordan had established himself as a major college prospect. His coming out party was the summer before his senior year when Coach Williams and the staff recognized him at camp and then he ended up going to five-star camp and really uh, playing great. Mike came to our camp and Sunday afternoon, the first day he was there, I was running the gym, and he came through, and that night I went to Eddie Fogler, and Eddie said, did you uh, see anybody you liked? And I said, Eddie, I think I just saw the best six foot four inch high school player I've ever seen. You couldn't get a ticket to see him play as a senior. Everyone who, from 30, 50, 60 miles around wanted to come and watch Michael Jordan play. After averaging 27 points and leading Laney High to a 19-4 season as a senior, Jordan packed his bags and headed for the only college he ever seriously considered, North Carolina. He soon learned there were no easy streets in Chapel Hill. A few weeks before practice started his freshman year, I said, Michael, you're going to have to do one thing. You're going to have to work a lot harder than you did in high school. And he said, I worked as hard as everybody else. And I said, do you want to be like everybody else? Number 23, Michael Jordan. He just showed he just couldn't wait to get to play basketball. But he kept that ball moving the whole time we were talking. While well, he was talking, too. He probably was thinking of ways to dunk. Jordan's diligence earned him the respect of his coaches. And in the 1982 NCAA final against Georgetown, with the Tar Heels down one, he wasn't afraid to pull the trigger in the final seconds. Guardy to Black. The tie, 18. Shot, Jordan! Michael Jordan! North Carolina has won the NCAA championship. The confidence and the competitiveness really grew in huge leaps and bounds after that freshman year. He competed from day one, and he worked and improved his shooting, outside shooting, as uh, he kept getting better every year he played. And it nearly loses it out. It is stolen now by Jordan. Uh-oh, they love that. MJ up in the rafters. Michael in the locker room before practice would point to somebody and say, I'm going to dunk on you today. And, uh, you know, it's like you didn't want to make eye contact with him because you didn't want to get picked. Jordan pulls up on a three-on-two right now. After an All-American sophomore season, Jordan was named Player of the Year as a junior in 1984. I hopped out the beam wagon with 
my jeans sagging, my whole team flagging. You ain't never seen swagging. I got the range waiting. You at the train station. Could have been had a deal, but I chose to remain patient. When the lead busts, get your head bust. Haters in my hood want to see me on the Fed bus. Going up the river, cause I'm touching Skrilla. I still fuck with Duke the God, still fuck with Killer. I still fuck with Hell Rev, still fuck with Vado. If I ain't say your name, you the bitch, nigga, die slow. In flames, I'ma be now, these lames wanna see now. How I'ma take over, because the game belong to me now. While leading North Carolina to a number one ranking and a meeting with Indiana in the Sweet 16. Three and a half hours before the game, we have a pregame meal and walkthrough. Pregame meal's over, we're all kind of sitting there, and Coach Knight goes down a list on who has who, and he comes to Jordan, and he gets this kind of sick look on his face, and he says, Dockage, you've got Jordan. I went back to my hotel room, and I threw up. But Dockage's defense helped hold Jordan to only 13 points as Indiana upset North Carolina. Jordan never played another minute for the Tar Heels. I saw Michael Jordan play basketball when he was 17, 18 years old, a couple years. And there was no doubt after I saw him with over 200 coaches watching him play um, courtside in the All-Star game at the, at the camp that I know Michael Jordan was sure enough special. The gym was packed. I mean, it's loud and it's raunchous. One of those... Wow, nice. It was raining. It was raining glass. They'd never seen anything like that. The man that could fly. Before winning a gold medal that summer at the 1984 Olympics, he entered the NBA draft. I told a very good friend of mine who had a draft pick that year that was pretty high in the NBA. And I said, you got to take Jordan. Well, we need a center. I said, play Jordan at center. After two centers were selected, Akeem Olajuwon by Houston and Sam Bowie by Portland, it was Chicago's pick. And now we are ready for the third pick. And the Chicago Bulls, who have been drafting very high down through the years, and they have the third pick today. The Chicago Bulls pick Michael Jordan of the University of North Carolina. All right, Michael Jordan, this is Eddie Doucette in New York. How you feeling? Just fine. How you doing? Real good. College Player of the Year amongst uh, so many other honors. Picked third in the NBA draft by the Chicago Bulls. And Rod Thorne, who drafted Michael, said at the time that he's going to be a fine offensive player, but not the kind that you could build an entire franchise around. Nobody really knew how good Michael was going to be. What were the Chicago Bulls before him? Doug Collins has hired his coach opening night there in the Madison Square Garden. Jordan goes over to Doug before the game, says, don't worry, coach, I'm not letting you lose this game. Scores 50 points. And from there, takes off on this spectacular season. Averages 37 points. Even though Magic and Bird are winning titles, this guy is the guy that everyone in the league wants to see. You have to remember that Chicago nights are cold. And they can be full of despair. And they can be brutal. And all of a sudden, there was something glorious right in the middle of the night. Here's a kaboom. <laughs> I'm like, fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a hell of a ride. You just knew it from day one. Earning Rookie of the Year honors, Jordan led the Bulls to the playoffs for the first time in four years. Then, with veterans Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, he lifted the NBA and the game itself to unprecedented heights. Michael comes in, he's a college star, he goes to the Olympics, and now it's all these stories of his leaping ability. He's scoring, he's dunking in his rookie year, he's averaging 28 points, and is one of the big stories of the NBA season. By now, the Bulls are owned by Reinsdorf. Jerry sees a lot of opportunities. They knew they had Michael, but now it was trying to figure out what else worked. That include players and coaches. That was kind of the task that Jerry Krause was given, was to observe what we had and really change the culture. I learned early on that the best thing I could do was compliment Michael. Michael Jordan, uh, I think, is the best that's ever played anything. I mean, if you were to draw a comparison, maybe you could pick uh, Jimmy Brown, uh, Babe Ruth, certainly Jack Nicklaus, but I'm not sure anybody took a game to the level that Jordan did. Like, and, and Jordan just had a great personality. We're, yeah. we're playing for the... Uh, for the gold medal in Los Angeles in 1984. The we're Olympics, yep. In the Olympics, and we're playing Spain. 
We're ahead by 28 points at the half. Jordan has played 11 minutes. He has 19 points, 12 rebounds, and 9 assists in 11 minutes. And we played the game about as well as basketball can be played. And I'm a great believer in let's play better in the second half yeah. than the first half. But I'm walking across the floor and I'm saying to myself, the hell am I going to say here to, to, to get us to play any better than this? And, and, and usually I don't have a problem with this, but, but I can't. So I'm at the locker room door, I open it, and the first guy I see in the locker room is Michael sitting in front of his locker. So kind of an idea hits me. I say, well, I'm going to jump on Jordan a little bit. <laughs> and these other guys are going to say, if he's that upset with Jordan, what the sure. hell does he think yeah. about me right now? So I walk over to Michael's locker, and I remember 11 minutes, 19 rebounds, or 19 points, 12, 12 rebounds, rebounds yeah. and 9 assists. This is the situation for Balan. There are less than a dozen points. Michael Jordan. 21 puntos y se escapan otra vez los norteamericanos. ¡Qué bárbaro! Jugador en la selección. Es puede desconocer. Quedan 14 minutos todavía para el descanso. Y vean las cosas que hace Michael Jordan. And I walk over and I say, Mike. <laughs> When the hell are you going to set a screen? I mean, we had four guys out there screening. When the hell are you going to screen somebody, Mike? I mean, all you're doing is rebounding, passing, and scoring. Damn it, screen somebody out here. And, and, and Mike looks up at me, you know, and, and you, you all know, and you, the world knows Michael Jordan's smile. I mean, it's the greatest. Yeah. Mike looks up at me, and he smiles, and he says, Coach. Didn't I just read last week where, where you said I may be the quickest player you've ever been around? And I said, what the hell has that got to do with you screening? And he says, Coach, I think I set him quicker than you can see him. Yeah. <laughs> That's Jordan. Great personality and a great, great player. What was your call on that last play? That was uh, get the ball, Michael. Everybody get the f*** out of the way. <laughs> Go to the basket. The tongue? The long baggy shorts, the clipped haircut. They're Jordan trademarks imitated by kids everywhere. Because kids know that Jordan plays for the same reason they do. He loves it. In fact, he's the only professional basketball player who has what they call a love of the game clause in his contract. It allows him to pick up a street game whenever he wants to. He was filming Space Jam. They got every piece of uh, workout equipment you can think of. Uh, there's a 18 hole putting situation in there for his golf, so he can do that too. This is just for him. This is just for him. Now, while he's filming, right. and because there was a strike, he's flying in all the guys in the league to come play pickup with him while he's not filming. So I walk in, I'm ready to hoop. Reggie Miller's there, Chris Weber's there, Chris Mullins there, Tim Hardaway is there, and Michael's in there talking more smack than you've ever seen. So he's in there, he gets triple teamed, does a spin around, throws one hand off the backboard. He's like, this ain't TV, this real. And he's talking to dudes that play in the league. Word. So I put my shoes on and I got back in my car <laughs> and I went home. <laughs> Outside of drafting Michael Jordan, the most significant draft was the year that they drafted Scotty and Horace. You could tell that they were going to give us a different dynamic on the floor. Their athleticism, their length was something that we didn't have. Now Michael was really a veteran, and now the younger guys had to come in and really show him that they could play. The closeness and the bond is just not something that happened overnight, especially when you talk about a guy like Michael, who was globally a huge icon. We just needed that time to bond as not only teammates, but as friends. This is when Jordan was rocking the red and white sweatsuits with the gold chains looking like a skinnier version of Mr. T at the time for crying out loud. Nice cross-court speed. Jordan going and throws it up. Oh. Oh, it's puts it in on an amazing move. <laughs> Under four and a half minutes to go. Here's Jordan. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's John, you're out of the action. I'm shooting this ball here. Oh, what a drive. Jordan on the move, baseline left. Oh, oh no! Oh, oh no! Yes. Leaves the middle open. Jordan, what a move! It counts on a sensational clutch. Oh. Jordan. Jordan, they isolate for him. Driving, what a move! Jordan on the breakout, driving all the way and jammed it home. Oh man! 
Jordan against Manu. Oh, Holy mackerel, what a shot. MJ with four. Oh. Jordan pulls up and lets it go with a flip over. And what a move. Oh, what a move. Out of body control. Just looking for penetration. Spin move. Hangs in the air off the glass. Oh, Jordan in deep on Elo. got 69 points in a game uh, against uh, Cleveland. He also had 18 rebounds. I said to my partner, do you realize we're watching a legend? This is like watching Babe Ruth. Michael Jordan is probably the greatest scorer to ever play in the game. Jordan was, it was a killer. People knew that they were in trouble. He saw Michael Jordan! Even in a game, if I see him do something like that, I would just grab my face and be like, oh my God, what did I just see? A spectacular move by Michael Jordan! His strength is like a big man. He's the strongest guard, I'm talking about body-wise, to ever play. Boston Garden was home to many great Celtic championship teams, but the 1985-86 Celtics, led by three-time MVP Larry Bird, were truly something special. They posted a franchise best 67 and 15 record that season, which earned them a meeting with Michael Jordan and the Bulls in the first round of the playoffs. Coming off a foot injury in only his second year in the NBA, Jordan was faced with an interesting problem. The question is, can one man beat the Lakers or do you need a more diversified attack today? Oh, we playing the Boston Celtics. His teammates took note of his focus in the locker room before the game and sensed he was intent on doing something big, maybe even the impossible defeating the mighty Celtics in Boston Garden, all by himself. Going baseline, Michael Jordan, the basket good and a foul. Fantastic quickness going to the baseline. That was a pickpocket move if there ever was one. But Larry Bird's Celtics presented an imposing obstacle indeed. United by Bird's vision, they were the consummate passing team. Bill Walton had joined the Celtics that year and blended flawlessly with their chemistry in his role as sixth man. On the other hand, the Celtics fans had never really seen an individual talent like Michael Jordan. And on April 20th, 1986, he was the center of their attention, even as the Celtics center, Robert Parrish, scored for their team. Parrish gets free. And so the battle waged, with Jordan evoking hushed cries of anguish, mixed with amazement from the savvy fans, while the Celtics' gritty play inspired their cheers. Who wants it? Mikhail! He was almost on his back. Taking the tempo away from the Celtics, trying to Michael Jordan right now. What a great shot, and a basket and a foul. You talk about Bird, sheer determination. At certain points of a game, Michael Jordan has those same qualities. The Celtics could only shake their heads. I know we started Dennis Johnson out on him, and then we went with uh, Danny Ainge, myself, uh, which it was real easy then when I started guarding him. Uh, then Bill Walton, and we was trying to run him to help all the time, but he had his outside shot going so well that he really didn't need to penetrate that much. Jordan backs it in, and Jordan with 40 points. He was in that zone of everything was going. He was making one shot better than the next. Unintimidated, even by Larry Legend, Jordan let it all hang out, displaying much more than mere hang time. He revealed a complete all-around game, as game two of this first-round series emerged as a classic in the making, with Jordan performing his unparalleled moves to the basket and Boston responding in tried-and-true Celtics fashion. Clock running down, three seconds, three-point shot, no good. And a foul, late sweep. A foul against Kevin McHale has been called by Middleton with no time showing on the clock. Kevin McHale can't believe it. In one of the first tests under pressure of his career, Michael Jordan showed all the poise of a veteran as he calmly stepped to the line and sank crucial free throws. He can tie it up here and send the game in overtime. No time remaining. And this is pressure. 0 
overtime in game two of our best of five first round NBA playoffs. And the Chicago Bulls are trying to do what only the Portland Trailblazers have done so far this year, beat the Celtics in Boston. Long range, Jordan hits it, 56 for Jordan. And that ties the Chicago Bulls all-time leader, Bob Love. Jordan goes up with a shot and hits it, and has 61 points to tie Elgin Baylor's all-time single-game playoff record that he established against these Celtics. Jordan ties the game. Oh, boy. 63 points, and you're looking at an all-time record. Oh, boy. Michael Jordan. Michael on the drive across the lane. Turnaround shot. Got it. 63 for Jordan. Goes in and gets 63 points against Boston. This is when Jordan was that dude. And Jordan rolled on the court and dropped 63 against Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics, where Larry Bird called him, called him the closest thing to God. It moved Larry Bird, the great Boston Celtics player, to say, that's not Michael Jordan. That's God disguised as Michael Jordan. Larry Bird talks about that game like it was the new coming of Jesus or something. <laughs> <laughs> he paid me the highest compliment, and you know I think uh, that was very gratifying. This guy, he's not just a great player. This guy is something different. Larry Bird says this is God disguised as Michael Jordan. He was coming in from the side. And we were running down there to try to close him off, and next thing I knew, he was going by me. The tempo of the game by the Bulls to try and get some fast break opportunities. Jordan, what should Jordan do in that case? Look, either put it off the glass, going baseline. Michael Jordan, the basket good and a foul. Jordan picks up McHale and takes the ball away from him. Well, McHale has no business putting it on the floor against a quick player like Michael Jordan. That was the Christmas massacre, but... Oh. Jordan against Dennis Johnson. Jordan Woolridge misses again. Here's Michael Jordan. Basket will be good and a foul and 25. For Michael Jordan. In the Taking the tempo away from the Celtics, trying to Michael Jordan right now. Ten points in this period for Ainge. And what a great shot. And a basket and a foul. Jordan against Ainge. Jumper, good. Chicago has led virtually all the way. Jordan backs it in. And Jordan with 40 points. Walton has come out to meet Jordan. Jordan trying to use his quickness, and it works. Michael Jordan with 44 now in the ball game. Jordan isolated one on one. They come out. Basket. Jordan cuts the Celtic lead to two. Here he is, the move. Jordan, short jumper. And it drops and 50 points for Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan has been a sensational show again. Long range, Jordan hits it. 56 for Jordan. Three on the shot clock. Jordan, basket, good, and a foul. Ainge guarding Michael Jordan. Jordan goes up with a shot and hits it and has 61 points to tie Elgin Baylor's all-time single-game playoff record that he established against these Celtics. It's Thursday. Jordan trying to fake Bird. Can't do it. With eight on the clock. Jordan ties the game. Oh, boy. 63 points, and you're looking at an all-time record. Oh, boy. Michael Jordan. Our Miller Lite most valuable player of the game is Michael Jordan with an all-time record 63 points in a single playoff game. In the end, the Celtics prevailed, and they would go on to win the series in three games. But from that day forward, the history of Boston Garden would include not only the many championships of Celtic teams past, but also the remarkable playoff performance of a young Chicago Bull named Michael Jordan. You know, he's a Mona Lisa. He has no imperfections. Michael doesn't seem to have any discernible weaknesses uh, whatsoever. Pound for pound, though, as they say in, in the fight world, uh, Michael probably has the greatest assortment of maneuvers offensively and defensively than, than anyone has ever had. For the last 30 years, kids around the world have now imagined themselves wearing that 23 jersey, time running out, tongue hanging out, and being just like Mike. His technique was flawless. I wanted to make sure my technique was just as flawless. And I, I looked at him, and for the first time in my life, a human being didn't look real to me. I pretty much was watching them instead of just playing against them, you know. I was like, I can't believe I'm on the same court, Michael Jordan, you know, all that stuff. Um, I was looking at the shoes and just looking at him and the ball head and the 23. I'm looking at his shoes and I'm like, man, he got on the Jordans. You know what I mean? Like, 
first time I played against him, uh, you know, the guys was giving me that, giving me that treatment in the locker room, and it was like, I was like, man, it's, it's, I know I see him on television, but is he that great? I learned a lot this game. A lot about how technically sound Michael was. Because it's one thing in watching him play, and then it's another thing in playing against him. That's a good day. <laughs> and he said a little something to me after he got that basket, but as you can see, that wasn't a foul. And I played him straight up. You know, that's the thing that most people don't do. It becomes more or less a, a mental game. You know, in the physical, you may have some advantage, you may not. You know, but the mental aspect, you should be able to pick him apart. Uh, it wasn't that uh, he had like 48 points that game, but it wasn't a 48 from being double team. I was playing him straight up, and he was just giving it to me. <laughs> so. Certainly the young kids grow from that and they become better players if they feed off of it and, 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 and work on the, their aspects of their game. You know, it was all the challenge going out there and playing against the Bulls, you know, guard Michael Jordan, nothing can top that. They've made a switch already putting Kobe on Michael. <laughs> Uh, Bambi, Bambi education. Accelerated learning. <laughs> wow. Been down at half court, and you wanted to know how, when I turn around on my jump shot, how to feel the defense. I told me you should feel the defense with your legs. Once you feel the defense with your legs, you can take advantage of that. The day will come where I step on the court with, in my eyes, the best basketball player that ever stepped on a basketball court. And uh, it was just an exciting moment for me, and it was something that I treasure for the rest of my life. Iverson draws Jordan now. Watch this. I mean, it was it was Mike. It was my idol. It was my hero. That was very inspiring for me. The rivalries back then were more significant than they are now, especially in a division, because you played those guys six times a year. And it seemed like every time you turned around, you were playing them. They were real rivalries. We, for years, got bullied by the Pistons. It was confrontational. We didn't like them. They didn't like us. It was a great rivalry. It did a lot for us in terms of teaching us. We knew that we were right there and that there was a few things that we had to do to get over the hump. It wasn't kind of just handed to us. We had to take our lumps along the way. Every year, we seemed to find a little bit more cohesiveness as a team, but it was a process and it involved Doug Collins kind of doing his thing for three years, getting us to a spot when hiring Phil Jackson and his teaching and coaching that gave us a, a little impetus to, to get to another level. We had a lot of adversity going into that game seven, which we thought we could win. We had such a great game six where we demolished them. After that game, there was a lot of long faces. You really got a sense of how important this game was and how important where we needed to be as a group. I remember Jordan standing up at the end of the game and we're in the locker room and he said, this will never happen again. We'll never lose to this team again. With a weak supporting cast, the Bulls won just three playoff series in Jordan's first five seasons. Twice they were eliminated by Detroit, known as the bad boys for their rough playground tactics. We knew how dangerous he was, and we knew going into the playoffs that we had to do something special. And so we very definitely devised what we called the Jordan rules. Every time he came to the basket, as opposed to giving up layups and dunks because that would energize their team and give them momentum, we would rather send him to the foul line. It was important that we mentally intimidated him, whether he had to knock him down or send three guys at him or just look mean, nasty, ugly in his face. One thing that Phil stressed more than anything against Detroit was they're the physical bad boys. They want to beat you up. In July of 1989, Doug Collins was replaced by assistant coach Phil Jackson, who had an idea how the Bulls might win. I called Michael in and told him basically what I saw as a problem with the team is that, you know, everything centered around him. I said, you know, the team had to share the basketball. And he said to me, you're not going to run that equal opportunity offense, are you? And I said, yeah, I am. Phil Jackson's trying to convince Jordan that the triangle offense is going to work. During the game, Jordan comes over to me at that press row and he goes, can you believe this freaking offense? This is ridiculous got double or triple teamed in a game in Milwaukee and Bill Cartwright is screaming for him to throw him the ball and he says I'm all by myself you're double teamed. Michael felt the team had a better chance of winning if he was shooting off double teams versus Bill Cartwright or Horace Grant shooting by themselves. 
there was a lot of feeling that Michael Jordan didn't make his teammates better, that he wanted to score all the time, and that he wouldn't pass the ball to certain people, and there was the feeling that he was not quite good enough to win a championship. Everyone's saying that a scoring leader can't be an NBA champion. I never believed that. He came a point in his, in his life, in his career, like, man, if I don't trust these guys, I don't think I'm going to win a championship. And once he decided to do that... Yes! Time is running out on this Detroit championship era. Chicago Bulls gunning for a sweep. It just absolutely came together in that playoff series against him. The Chicago Bulls advance to the NBA championship round. And we're set for the start of game one of the NBA championship we had a lot of jitters and nerves. We were playing against, you know, the world-renowned Lakers. The look away to Levingston. Jordan. Oh, a spectacular move by Michael Jordan. That's 13 consecutive field goals. We welcome you back to the forum. We didn't really have the fan support. It was a road game for us. We had to come together at the 12 players and the staff that was there, and it was really just up to us. After defeating their nemesis, the Pistons, for the Eastern Conference title in 1991, the Bulls charged to a three games to one lead over the Lakers in the finals. In game five, Jordan was faced with the ultimate sacrifice. Phil Jackson will tell you that during the huddle of the final game, against the Lakers, he finally had to get in Michael's face. I mentioned to him that John Paxson was open. Michael made a point of finding John Paxson in that fourth quarter for four jump shots in a row. And that really kind of sealed the factor that here was a guy who was willing to give the ball up at a time when he knew that he had to do whatever it took. Bulls lead by seven. Final seconds, Magic's three-point attempt blocked. Pippen comes away with it. And the Chicago Bulls have won their first ever NBA championship. And Michael Jordan has answered a couple of questions. There have been doubters over the years whether a team led by Jordan could win a championship. The Chicago Bulls have won their first ever NBA championship. It's an honor to take this on behalf of a great organization and the wonderful fans of Chicago. We all as players really thank you all for your support. And we all want you to know that this one is for you. But we're going to be back here next year for another long struggle. He's the most fundamentally sound basketball player I had ever seen. You know, and he was the first guy that I had seen who was super athletic to be fundamentally sound. You can find a guy as quick as him, but he wouldn't be as strong as him. You can find a guy as big as him, but he wouldn't be as quick as him. You know, so it, it was tough to get power and quickness and strength all together. To me, realistically, it's probably the closest thing you could ever come to a perfect physique basketball-wise. In my opinion, the best basketball player ever, but uh, probably more importantly, the best competitor ever. First thing that jumps out at the morning house is his competitiveness. He had to put up spectacular numbers, but he also, in his own mind, recognized that the fans came to see him do something spectacular every single game. Jordan off the spin to the scoop! That's worth the price of admission in itself. We marveled at his skills, but the thing that we that really, you know, made him stick out was that his determination and his will to keep to keep coming at you and never stop. You know, you'd root for a guy and have a big game and uh, you know, maybe a 30, 40 point game and you sit there and root for him. But to see this guy do it every night. And that was what stood out the most any player I've ever seen. Michael was a guy who, uh, you know, he wanted to win. Uh, he wanted to achieve that goal. And uh, he, he was a guy that you could see step up to a level, a certain level to, to help his team win. Best player I ever saw, no offense, Magic. Just incredible in person. But, you know, two things stand out for me. One, just how famous he was. And then the second, it, you know, homicidally competitive. Like really, like almost you could say he had a problem. He was so competitive. His entire life just revolved around beating other people.
People have no idea how obsessed Michael Jordan is with winning at something. Not just beating you when he was in his prime, but humiliating you with putting you away, with putting you down so that you were no longer a threat to compete with him again. Oh, and Reggie Miller came over and smacked All right, Michael, okay, yeah. and MJ is upset yeah. about it, and I can't blame him. Yes, sir, he ran right into him, and we got a brouhaha here. I started talking as soon as I got into the league, but I had a bad experience. What was the bad experience? Throughout his career, Michael Jordan gained the reputation of a competitive psychopath. My rookie year, uh -huh. we were playing the Chicago Bulls, and this is Michael Jordan's third or fourth year in. Okay. And we were playing an ex exhibition game in some obscure place. And most veterans do not like to play in exhibition games. They want to get to the real thing. I'm a wide-eyed, energetic rookie, and we're playing this exhibition game, and Michael's going through the motion. And Chuck Person, who's on my team, who's a trash talker as well, is like, can you believe Michael Jordan, the guy everyone's talking about, who's supposed to be able to walk on water? You're out here killing him, Reg. This is in the first half. He's <laughs> like, you should be talking to him. He's like, you know, you're right. Michael, who do you think you are? <laughs> the great Michael Jordan? That's right. There's a new kid on town, right? Kind of looks at me and starts shaking his head. So at half, I have 10, and he has four points, right? And I'm doing all this talking. He's like, OK. Into the, into the game in the second half, he ended up with 44, <laughs> and I ended up with 12. <laughs> so he outscored me 40 to 2. And as he's walking off, he's like, be sure and be careful, you never talk to black Jesus like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Black Jesus. I'm so sorry. Several stories highlight this, such as the time he was beaten in ping pong, body table, and practiced so much that he became the best player on the team. Or the time he was caught cheating against an old woman in a meaningless game of cards. It was my mother and Michael and myself playing just a simple game of go fish or something, and I caught him cheating my mother. And I said, I said, are you that competitive? Were you going to cheat my own mother in cards? I said, you got to be kidding me. One day they fly into Portland, and the trainer notices that Michael is giving one of the baggage handlers a $50 bill. Michael says, watch this. So they get down to the baggage area, and the bet is whose baggage is going to come out first. And guess whose luggage comes out first? Number 23, he scoops up about $1,000, puts it in his pocket, looks at the trainer, winks, and says, Pretty good return on a $50 bet. Mom, this is the winner. Right. Mom, right. I'm gonna get rich. We just lost the Boston Celtics, but guess what? I'm winning! He is so competitive. I can remember beating him in a game of pool three games in a row, and he didn't speak to me for 24 hours. Michael Jordan was on a bus, and players were sort of comparing how famous they were. Michael Jordan kind of sat there. Finally, somebody said something like, I bet even Michael can't get a hold of Janet Jackson. He took out a cell phone, de -de 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 -de, dialed up, said, uh, is Janet there? Uh, just towards MJ, you know. Two seconds later, Janet Jackson was on the phone. I think it came from doubters early on in my life and my determination to prove them wrong, starting from a high school coach that cut me to my principal who said that I should go to an Air Force Academy to guarantee myself a job after I finish college. For him to just do it, he has to win at it. In fact, he's taught our children that. My kids love to play basketball. They ask me to come up and watch them play one-on-one. -on -one. I tell my youngest to come over and sit down, you know, and I talk to him about being able to accept losing, but yet still competing. I said, watch, I'm going to go out and I'm going to your, play your brother and I'm going to show you exactly what it's all about. So I'm playing him pretty serious and I know that at any point in time I can steal the ball and I can go ahead and win the game. But my oldest kid hit a basket, so it's 4-2. I'm saying, well, i got to get serious here because I'm really trying to prove a point to my kid. So the oldest fakes one way, head and shoulder fakes and throws up the most luckiest shot you've ever seen and it goes in. And I'm pissed. And I look back at my son. He looked at me and said, next. And I looked, and I turned away, and I smiled. I'm saying, you know what? That's my son. Because that's exactly what I would say. Mike's ultra competitiveness was really highlighted in practice, where he treated every scrimmage the same as if it was game seven of the NBA Finals. He also expected his teammates to play with the same intensity and would abuse them if they didn't. If Jordan's rage to prove himself inspired his teammates, it could also burn them. 
I've seen Michael come in a lot of times and, you know, knock over all the Gatorade cups and go off and say, if y'all ain't gonna play, stay in the locker room. Phil Jackson was never the coach of that team. Michael Jordan was the coach. Jordan was the one who yelled at them. Jordan was the one they feared. Jordan was the standard they had to live up to. Michael is just, he's killing Bill Cartwright all the time. In the locker room, in front of everybody, Cartwright gets Michael aside. And he says, look, if you ever do anything like that again, you will never play basketball because I'm going to break both your legs. He said some things to me that I really didn't like and, um, and uh, I couldn't take it. If you let him ride you, he would ride you to the moon. He would ride you right out of the NBA and out of your mind. Phil put Steve Kerr opposite of me, but he was giving Steve all the calls. Now I'm getting like really ticked off. So I started to play very, very physical. Well, Steve started giving me hard fouls. Next thing you know, I hauled off and just whacked him right in the eye. And then Phil threw me out of practice and I get home and I'm just like really hurt. And they gave me Steve's phone number and I got his answer machine. And I said, Steve, I am so sorry. You know, my anger got the best of me. After every fight I've ever seen him in, he's always apologized. He never wanted to hurt you. He had to do whatever he had to do to make you raise your stakes that much higher. To me, it wasn't a surprise that he got in trouble gambling because he goes all out. He's the ultimate chase better. Lose, double up. Lose, double up. The team won the first championship. He got invited to the White House, and Michael says he's not going. And the team's in a turmoil. On the day his team was going to the White House, Michael Jordan was, you know, in this game, gambling with one guy who was a convicted drug dealer, another guy, a bail bondsman, who was funding the game, who originally got murdered by his associates. And then it turns out that, uh, you know, he wrote a check for his gambling losses, which is, you know, it was a paper trail he, you know, was naive about. A crack had formed in Jordan's carefully constructed facade. Six months after the Bulls' first championship, a book detailing Jordan's rough treatment of teammates and the special treatment the club accorded him hit the New York Times bestseller list. Its title, The Jordan Rules. Paxson has a flu and it's about 103 degree fever. And he, he comes in, gets his medication, goes home. Now Jordan gets it a couple of days later, calls in, they send the trainer out to his house. In 1993, another book claimed Jordan lost a million dollars on the golf course. Meanwhile, the media, once Jordan's vigilant protector, feasted on a report that he gambled the night before a playoff game in New York. All he wanted was just some respect about the issue. Hey, I went down to Atlantic City. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't miss practice. What are you getting on me for? As soon as he went to the golf course and started losing too much money to please us, he was pilloried for, oh, is your gambling really under control there, Michael? As the story gained extended life, Commissioner David Stern was forced to take a closer look. While Jordan simmered and the media swarmed, a former U.S. federal judge was hired to conduct a league investigation. I don't think he regrets the gambling. I think he remains angry that the gambling is what people tried to bring him down on. He felt like that he had been over backwards for the media so much that it really hurt him to have anything negative come out about him. Michael Jordan story. You guys remember Anthony Peeler? Yes. Okay, so out we of got Missouri, we, right? Out of Missouri. Yeah. So we got Chicago Bulls coming in town, <clears throat> and unfortunately, uh, I got a sprained <laughs> ankle. You know, and so did you say fortunately? You unfortunately, oh, okay. Unfortunately, okay. I, I enjoy guarding Mike because he was, you know, the one thing I did with Mike is I never got him pissed off. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he make a shot, you say, "Good shot, Mike." You know, you don't talk trash to him no, so no. he can go off for of sixty. You know, you, can, you try to kill him with kindness. Yeah. You don't try to talk trash to him. So they're getting off the bus. We're done with shoot around, and we're walking out. And MJ says, "B Scott, what's going on?" I said, "What's up, MJ?" He said, "Man, I, I hear that you're not playing tonight." I said, no, I'll spring my ankle. He said, who's guarding me? I said, Anthony Peeler. He said, oh, 50. <laughs> <laughs> so I told Anthony Peeler, listen, um, MJ, uh, he's probably going to go for about 50 tonight on you. So just <laughs> don't don't piss him off. You know, just be cool. He, had, he ended up with 54. <laughs> so so uh, the man could do basically whatever he wanted to do on that basketball court. It's hard to overstate Michael Jordan's greatness, but he has done it at a time when everything has come together. Michael Jordan is CEO Jordan. MJ. Those new Air Jordans. 
he had all of the media exposure that the other guys before him didn't have on uh, internet, cable, satellite TV. Game four in Chicago, in a word, Michael. Yes, it was a national holiday. Michael did not take off, he just took off on the net. He became the Pied Piper. Television ratings followed him, fans followed him. They flocked into stores to buy anything that was endorsed by him. You better eat your Wheaties. Michael Jordan created all kinds of fans, including a lot of women fans. Please welcome Michael Jordan. Jordan, to his credit, knew that every minute he was in front of a camera was an audition for another company. Here's a black man who's the most popular person in a white society. I mean, what bigger benefit for a company can there be to cross the racial divide with a guy who's popular everywhere. You think about all the things that Michael Jordan's influenced, starting with the baggy shorts, bald head, the shoes. His feet and the Air Jordan trademark belong to Nike for a cool two million. We see the powerful impact that he's had on our society and on our culture. Fortune magazine says Jordan is responsible for soaring revenues, an estimated $10 billion during his career. goes across national boundaries where uh, friends of mine go to the heart of the Congo and they see kids in number 23 Chicago Bull uniforms. I thought uh, Magic Johnson was the most famous basketball player in the world still when the Dream Team went to Barcelona and I was mistaken. Uh, Michael was big enough that there were 40-foot murals. Other big advertisers also capitalized on the Jordan mystique, a fast food empire. I think we're going to be here a while. I suggest you go get a Big Mac. The quintessential cereal for athletes. You better eat your Wheaties. Even underwear. Just wait until we get a hands on you. And a certain energy drink that had been around for years but saw its sales dramatically increase with consumers taking a cue from the commercial's simple message. Advertisers could kind of work with him to bring out almost the chameleon in his personality, the chameleon in his brand, and he could adapt just as easily to help sell McDonald's in a fun, playful way, way as he could Gatorade. And you really think about it, those are really two competing products. Gatorade is, you know, more, more health-driven, and it's the optimizing performance, and McDonald's is a traditional fast food. But he was just as comfortable not only in his own shoes there, but also in his own in the eyes of the buyers, which would follow, and they, they trusted him as well, which are key things. I think it was just um, how down to earth he seemed, and just how he was able to also laugh at himself. I mean, he really, you know, had the ability to kind of poke fun at himself, and he just had that engaging smile and personality. And, um, you know, I just really think that he, he, what he did was had these just otherworldly athletic skills, but then just had a really, really kind of down to earth style on camera. And I thought that those two things blended perfectly to make him as marketable as he was. The Jordan sensation has touched off a whole new generation of sports advertising over the last 25 years. From a tiger on the golf course to the hardwood with endorsement kings named LeBron and Kobe. I'm trying to take it even a step further, not in terms of you know, marketing deals and things of that nature, but he got us thinking in that same mode where we can you know, try to be businessmen like he is. I don't think there will ever be a stars aligned opportunity like you saw with Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was the Beatles of sports marketing in a sense that he was the first. And everyone else that followed ultimately is almost an impersonator to him in what he represented. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jordan. Because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. More than liked, Jordan was adored. Is he the greatest player ever, Danny? Yes. Because he played both ends of the court. He Offensively, there could be some debate, although I think he was one of the best offensive players, but because of everything he did, yes, and his competitive edge. Magic. Oh, he's the greatest player, and Bill Russell is the greatest winner. Uh, Michael, no, no question, Michael is heads and shoulders above everybody else. He not only dominated on offense and defense, but he also dominated. There will no, never be a basketball player, and I don't know if there will ever be another athlete to make as much money on the court and off the court as Michael Jordan. It's just, it, he, he, he will go down like Muhammad Ali and maybe even bigger.
As Michael Jordan exploded into superstardom in the 1980s, we also saw the worlds of sports and fashion collide like never before. Whether it was the 23 jersey or those famous Air Jordans, everybody had to have them. Are you still close with Michael Jordan or were you ever close with Michael Jordan? Uh Michael Jordan and I are friends, and sure. I call him all the time because I like his brand, Jordan sneakers. And now, I know you got a huge contract with the company. Put, put your feet okay. down. <laughs> it was the Beatles of footwear because it changed everything. In an instant, it became a playground must-have all by itself. It transformed the essence of urban fashion. Yo, Mars Blackman here with my main man, Michael Jordan. Yo, Mike, what makes you the best player in the universe? Is it the vicious stumps? No, Mars. Is it the haircut? No, Mars. Is it the shoes? No, Mars. Is it the extra long shorts? No, Mars. It's the shoes in, right? Money's gotta be the shoes. Shoes, shoes, shoes. Shoe. The whole marketing of the Air Jordan line was predicated on the style and the class and the competence and capability and the performance that Michael Jordan brought to the basketball court. There's a kaboom! <laughs> when they first came out, I mean, it, it, was, it was so hot, everybody had to get a pair, me included. Now, how, how much do you... No, stop that. That's a, now, they won't let any of this on. Okay. Now, how much do you get paid just to wear these shoes? A lot. <laughs> a whole lot. A yeah. lot. 450,000 pairs of Air Jordans were sold in the first month. That's when stores, you know, were opening up at midnight because the lines were around the corner. No shoe really had that. No shoe. Nah. Is it the short socks? No, Mars. Money's gotta be the shoes. Shoes, shoes, shoes. Shoe. You sure it's not the shoes? All right, now, Michael, is this the shoe? Now, you, of course, we can't show what kind of shoe this is. Hey, that's okay. The color stands for But it. is this the shoe that the NBA wouldn't let you wear? Yeah. Now, why wouldn't they let you wear it? Just because just it's ugly, no, no, I guess, for starters. <laughs> Shouldn't he be paying you to wear those shoes and those clothes around? Well, you know, when you're good friends, you don't care about his money. I see. I okay. just want the clothes and the sneakers. <laughs> Release the content, go. cease the nonsense. Yeah. Dealing with the beasts of the Eastern Conference. Yeah. All the hate do is just increase the dawn strength. Didn't you help design these? Is the shoe, not the color. Oh, not the I color. Have anything to do with okay, the so, but what's wrong with the coloring? They, uh, what, what, what rule do we violate here? The Air Jordan's initial design, a red and black two color scheme, was illegal by NBA standards. Yet Nike's first ads in the spring of 1985 made it sound as though the shoe had been banned for giving an unfair advantage to a luminous new star. On September 15th, Nike created a revolutionary new basketball shoe. On October 18th, the NBA threw them out of the game. Fortunately, the NBA can't stop you from wearing them. Well, it didn't have any white in it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, neither does the NBA. <laughs> It's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. It's, it's just a joke, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just a joke. What an asshole. With success came controversy. The first Air Jordans cost $65 a pair. Later models hit the three figure mark. Critics attacked Nike for pricing Air Jordans out of the reach of the lower income kids who'd crave them the most. A hundred and thirty-five dollars, a hundred and forty-five dollars, a hundred and eighty-five dollars for a pair of gym shoes, for a pair of sneakers. We've got a lot of young kids out in the south side and west sides of Chicago who really shouldn't be buying a hundred and fifty dollar sneakers because uh, they should be spending a little bit of that money on books. You can have problems because people do what they need to do to get the money or steal that stuff, which, which is being hawked at them. And there were problems. In Maryland and Texas, teens were killed by thugs who were after their Jordans. The tragedies that took place between kids, killings, assaults over clothing, as well as shoes, was an indication of what we had taught as a culture. Wearing the right clothes, identifying with the right uh, image, uh, became their sole hook and handle on their own personal 
self-esteem. Air Jordans anticipated the cultural dominance of hip-hop swaggering materialism. They became the ideal evening dress wear for the street smart young urban man. The greatest motherfuckers can't beat us, join us, can't beat us, hate us, can't touch it, can't see them, try to be them. And the suburban teen or baby boomer who wanted a taste of Jordan's electrifyingly luxe style. There are certain movies and certain cars that are uh, unique and they kind of start trends and start things. That's an Air Jordan. It's a trend starter. As much as you want to wear those on the basketball floor, you want to wear those to school, you want to wear them to functions. I've had numerous, I have a closet full of Jordans. And um, I think the, the, the ones I liked the best was the patent leather. Those were crazy. I used to wear them with suits. For basketball players, they felt as if they got a pair of Air Jordans, they can go out there and, and play like them. And for guys or girls who didn't play basketball, they still thought if they got the, the Air Jordans on, they would be as important as, say, a Michael Jordan. You know how I get up for my game? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? That's right. Air Jordan, Air Jordan, Air Jordan. I think what Michael and Nike were able to accomplish was to mainstream uh, sports apparel into everyday apparel and make it a fashion statement. People all over the world know about those shoes and people all over the world, some of them don't know how to play basketball or even know, you know about the game of basketball, but they wear those shoes. They also make the shoes. Jordan sloughed off criticism from activists who said his sneakers were being made overseas by exploited workers, earning less than a living wage. Last year, Jordan countered those claims by visiting an Asian shoe factory. I saw a commitment to try to improve an environment. It's easy to compare that to the United States, and, and I think that's somewhat unfair, and, and, and I think you have to compare it to what was happening within that country. Yes, the Air Jordan caught some cultural waves, the growing influence of the inner city on fashion, the pricey aesthetic of the rap movement. The graying boomers lust for eternal youth and grace. But let's face it, they were cool. And so was the man whose name and soaring figure adorned every pair. Two decades later, their synergy stands in history. Michael's legacy and impact on his culture, from the marketing, shoe, celebrity, business side of it, is going to outlast and have more enduring impact than what he did on the court because what he did on the court was absolutely, literally unbelievable. We just enjoy the moment and feel that we've made an impact on, on society as well as the sport industry and fashion and, and I think that drives us. Mike Joe in the rap outside Jay working. Now watch how quickly I drop 50. I don't like playing. Niggas can't stick me. Niggas cannot jam me. Niggas thank you, Jim. 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 Listening to the sounds of a God in the flesh My lineage is ancient I come from beyond any place you could imagine In your imagination Mommy was my spaceship It took her nine months to get me here I finally made it Goodness gracious, great balls of fire My star got six points, so I burn brighter The any pentagram on Hollywood sidewalk I'm much too hot, you cannot cool me off Now the sun don't chill our law Check the rhyme that I spill on y'all It's the best by far Initiate of the sacred Brotherhood of elite rappers I'm a master builder Grand verbalizer Young old timer The tippy top shot original Don Dada It's written in the stars Look me up there Two or three bars Got you pay attention I'm gifted, my rap is mystic It's cold that I speak so the police missed it Spray painted on the walls Writings on the walls. I'm gifted, my rap is mystic. It's codes that I speak, so the police missed it. Put on some real tough shit that I can rock to. To write the illest words you ever could bop to. 
I live the illest life you ever could have. So much joy, I cry. So much pain, I laugh. At my best, I am excellent. At my worst, I'm not inspired by the beat. Shit come out weak. It's not bad for a bad day. I smack you and knock your head off. Damn, I don't know my own strength like a lion. I was just trying to play. It's not my fault. You fall apart so easy. I need to be with my own kind. Take me to where the rap music is powerful. Beats and rhymes. Whole nother channel. Don't be so shallow. Expand your taste. It's more to life than your narrow mind think. And we lie from the refuge. Is anybody out there? It's written in the stars. Look me up then. Two or three bars. Got you pay attention. I'm gifted. My rap is mystic. It's cold that I speak, so the police missed it. Spray painted on the walls. The writing's on the walls. I'm gifted. My rap is mystic. It's cold that I speak, so the police missed it. Chapman yeah. versus Michael, Michael yeah. Jordan. Yeah, I think it was. Watch Rex own <laughs> Michael. So when you start going off on Michael, uh-huh. does he say anything? We actually that game, and I I'd forgotten about it. Somebody showed a video of it not long ago because it was like uh, 20, 20 years, I guess, after the after the fact, and it showed. <laughs> you know, you you couldn't let Michael dunk it. If it was sort of a rule, if he if he dunked it. it Crowd's going to get into it. His teammates get into it. So, Wait, so that was team wide team, that everybody yeah, knew. If Mike goes up, you, you foul him. Yeah, you got to foul him. But okay. you know, preferably before he gets off the ground. Yeah. You know, not to hurt him. And he made a move baseline, and I was a help defender running through the lane with my back, and I turned and saw him coming, and you know, I sort of launched into him. MJ up high, the screen roll, makes the move inside, double pumps, and he got fouled. Rex Chapman held him. Just to get him before he got off the ground. And I don't think he's, we had the same agent forever. Michael called me to go to Carolina in 1984. Oh, he recruited you? Yeah. So I'd known him forever, but I think he didn't see who got him. He did, and he turned around to say something, and we kind of got nose to nose. He called for second Rex Chapman in his in Michael's face now. And Alonzo Mourning in Michael's face now. There was no anything really said worth anything. I think I said something like, you know, I can't let just let you dunk it. And so, but it looked like we're, yeah. And so everybody's like, oh, you were talking so much noise to Jordan. I was like, no, I was not doing that. And then you go off for yeah, 39. We, yeah, we only had eight guys. We'd made a big trade, eight guys available. And I- Harper and Jordan at the guards, Pippen and Rodman at forward, Luke Longley in the middle. Twelve guys for the Chicago Bulls, a full team around Phil Jackson. The Miami Heat, it looks like a small gathering of friends, doesn't it? I think Michael and Scotty and Dennis and those guys came down to South Beach the night before. Uh-oh. And we're like, it's a night <laughs> off. <laughs> At, but as Jimmy Lynham always used to say uh, to us, you let a guy get going in this league, and you got a problem. And I got it going one night, and we got lucky. Rex Chapman puts up the three. Rex Chapman, an open three. Back out, Chapman for three. Long Rex Chapman for the open three. Rex Chapman, quick, long three. Oh, MJ almost got it. Chapman, an open three. Chapman again with the three. Inside Rex Chapman with the Rex Chapman off balance three. It doesn't matter. 59 now is Chapman. Double pump. Put it up. And it is the Rex Chapman show now. Rex Chapman for three. Chapman comedy for three. Yes, absolutely. That could be the nail. But you don't, there's no, Jordan doesn't say anything. Like, is there just, uh, it's your night? I'm going to uh, let you have your yeah, night. Now, they, they were. Did you beat them? We beat them. We beat them. And, and uh, you know, they were 
they were not happy. We played them a few weeks later at home. And again, Michael and I are buddies. We same agent ball goes up and we're around the jump circle and bang, right to my chest, <laughs> right to my chest. And I went, all right, great. You know, let, let's do it. I mean, that's the, that's the mindset you have to have. But right then and there, I knew was not, I was not having 39 again. <laughs> I think I went four for 14 for 14 points yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. The Eastern Conference was much more physical. New York was a hard-hitting physical series. I go to town on you, beat the crown off you, beat the clothes off you, trying to get the hounds off you. Nigga fighting back, it's only gonna make it worse. I don't respect your little punches, I'ma make it hurt. A cold lead shower, a hot blood bubble bath, throw him in the acid and get rid of the gooey mess. Turn that nigga into special sauce, chill laws. I'm not a killer, but you pushing me to set it off. And I'ma lash out, and I'ma mash out, laughing. I'm wicked, blow the hash and the cush down. Focus on the bread when niggas try to gaffle me. That's when I treat them with force and brutality. My palms keep itching. My money don't stop because my work keep clicking. I got it both locked. Gang of Indians but smoke the peace pipe dolo. Excuse you because when it's murder, I solo. Word collision, I talk reckless. Position precious stones in the necklace. Little doggy, this is chest, not Tetris. Little cold sore, I spray the chloroseptic. Relentless or a cryptic black hoodie discus. Ellsworth bumping the Dutch man back to business. Car bombings, Tommy gun spinning bullets, spit out a witness. Mix the K2 with the eucalyptus plant. Pistol in hand, rock on the sleep like tryptophan. The douse the weapon and spick and span, your triggers jam. I shoot fast like Vinny the microwave. Roll a spliff with a Bible boogie board on a tidal wave. Very groovy prosthetic limbs by Louis. Rap pornographic snuff movie. Burner Lucy. Denim do rag. Cavalli Kufi. The brolic finger ring is excrement. The chains dookie. Uh. Motherfuckers, fuckers, fuckers. Yeah. yeah, all the time, every time, my gun erupt, my money climb, my bitch fine, I dress clean, but I'm a dirty New York out that killer queens, I eat good, I rap great, my life is fucking awesome, yeah, fucking A, I take off, just launch pad to zero gravity, I float, I don't fall, I can, so high, it's no coming down. So fly, I just might go south. MIA, water sports, you leave me be, or it'll be a holocaust. Homicides, prison time, hospital emergency when it's dinner time. Eat a skull, eat a spine, he in bad shape, he can't be identified. We just came off a very convincing series against Miami. Uh, we thought we could waltz right through New York. Yes, sir. Oakley just came over and annihilated Bill Cartwright. And showing tenacious defense. Tell me the experience. You got Michael Jordan. You got to guard Michael Jordan, yeah. right? So the, uh, the only player who played Michael more in the playoffs was Isaiah Thomas. So here's what Michael said about you in retrospect. He said, I love John Starks. He was really a competitor. He really tried to challenge me. But I think that he knew when he was guarding me, he was overmatched. For even as public Jordan mushroomed into a global marketing colossus, the private man shrank ever deeper into a glass-walled isolation chamber. He told me once that when he walks through a crowd, even if he appears not to be looking at the people in the crowd, he can feel every eye on his skin. And he said it's like a burning feeling. Until I'm alone again, I feel the burning, those eyes looking into me. If you're Michael Jordan and you're that celebrated, and that good. The phone rings a thousand times a day with people who have ideas that they say are good for you. This is going to be really good for you. It's not good for you. It's good for them.
And he said, those two and a half hours on the court every game night is the most peaceful time of my day. He said, because it's like there are invisible walls around the court. It's the one part of my day that no one can touch me, no one can come up and ask for an autograph, no one can pitch a business deal. I'm meditating out there. Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move by Jordan! It counts! And the foul! What did you think of Michael Jordan? Oh, man. Um, obviously, Michael is the greatest in my book. Um, been able to uh, play him and uh, growing up watching him play in college, you know, and getting the opportunity to play him, you know, while I was in pros was a highlight of my career. Uh, you know, one thing about him, and Antonio can probably attest to, is uh, just his will to win. Uh, I think that's what made him so great. And, you know, you already know when you're going into a game against Michael Jordan and a Michael Jordan team that you had to play your very best in order to beat him. Three, B.J. Armstrong spot up next shot. That's a violation. It'll be the next ball. We anticipate him playing him. A certain way and they came out totally different physical hungry aggressive does he talk a lot on he, court no he he don't talk unless you talk to him and oh, you okay. don't want to do that <laughs> but when he sees a rookie yeah when he see yeah he, he was talking he was talking at the time what'd he tell you what he say well he told me before the night over you're gonna be calling me mr jordan <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> Chicago is a confident, cocky team. They've sort of breezed through the league all season. They've breezed through the first round of the playoffs, and right now, they're being challenged. Big jam by Ewing. They are stunned here at Chicago Stadium. They shocked us the first game in our place, which was very embarrassing to us. This team is for real. If we, if anybody took them for granted, you know, certainly uh, we realize that you know they're a team to deal with. If New York has an advantage, it's the feeling that they can muscle Chicago inside. McDaniel into Ewing for the jam. This is a big, physical, wide New York team that plays you tough, and it takes its toll on you. Purdue with the bad pass. Wilkins follows Jordan, knocked it out of bounds. Chicago ball. What a great effort by Michael Jordan. At some point in that game, you know that he's going to take over the game. And you have to be able to, to uh, play them as hard as possible. I always say, you know, my mentality was when I took the court against Michael Jordan is that I'm going to go out there and make him work for every single point. And that's what I tried to do. You know, you couldn't stop him. And all you can do is just try to frustrate him, and, and hopefully um, that was enough. Jordan off the screen, makes the move, comes back in the but normally that wasn't enough. If we seem to have control of the series, we never really did. And they kept coming and taking it back. Shot clock at the three. Ewing with the steal. It's a three on one. Jackson behind the three. People think because the Bulls are the world champion, we're supposed to just lay down and just let them do whatever they want to us. Hey, this is a game. This is a man's game. Oh, hit hard by Anthony, and Michael threw the ball at Anthony. Jordan is very upset. It's more of a foul on Jordan. And Jordan is fouled. And back come the Bulls. Oh, he is ripped by Starks. This has become a war. Here's Ewing. Yes. They're fighting like cats and dogs, and then uh, we just fell apart. You think so you're going home? This way? Do we have a choice? Can you recover? Yeah, we don't have a choice. Some predicted a sweep, most a five-game series, but be honest now, nobody thought it would go seven. If we see a New York victory today, this might well rank as one of the biggest upsets in the history of the NBA. Now, the New York series was one of those fatherly uh, advice type of series. So I kind of asked him, what should I do? How should I attack? Should I feed off my teammates? Or should I go out and be the leader and, and let them follow my lead? And like most fathers, I mean, he said, take the lead. If they don't follow you, they don't follow you. But you have to take the lead. Hard right. They're fouled hard by Oakley again. It's a flagrant foul again. And now, McDaniel wants a 
piece of Pippen. I was ready to go blows with it. Both clubs going at each other. Michael Jordan and Xavier McDaniel having words. I felt that I had to talk trash to the bully so we all can gain confidence. Pippen to Jordan. Going out and competing against him every single day, you know, lift my game up to a whole another level. And most guys that played against him enjoy that aspect of playing against him because you know that he was going to come at, at you every single night. He's probably one of the few players that you can say is probably was on top of his game every single night. You know, and when he wasn't on top of his game, he hitting you for 30. And when he was on top of his game, like he was a couple of nights, he hit you for 55. So... <laughs> Um, people say, did you ever talk noise against Michael Jordan? I never talk noise against Michael Jordan because you don't want to wake him up. just a part of the role that I have on the team uh, is to be able to lead. So that following advice kind of worked in hand for me that day. Michael Jordan took dunking to another level just for the simple fact is he gave us all the illusion that he could fly. Michael is obviously one of the greatest leapers, you know, that ever played in this game. And the power that he brings in his dunks, you know, is just amazing. His creativity, style, hang time, he had it all. My all-time favorite from Michael Jordan has to be when he did Rock the Cradle. Every kid in America, I think, tried to rock the cradle, but nobody could ever dunk it. We all just lay it up. He had a drive. He had a, a God-given ability to be able to dunk, and he had a relentless ability to try to destroy his opponent by any means necessary. I can remember standing on the basket one time when Michael was coming in from the side. We were running down there to try to close him off, and next thing I knew, he was going by me. And, you know, I mean, his shorts were going right by my face, and uh, he dunks over Parrish and me. It wasn't for nothing that he was called Air Jordan. One of Michael Jordan's thunderclap dunks in New York is still held in awe. Me and Charles Oakley had him trapped in the corner, and he did a half moon, like he was getting ready to go back out to spin, but he spent back baseline. Just an incredible dunk. I didn't say anything to Patrick after that. There was, you know, no dunk ever done that he wouldn't try. As in all things, you know, Michael was in a class by himself or awfully like, close to it. He's the ultimate jump high, jump low, creative, fly, sky. He just kind of did things the way he wanted to. Michael brought a grace and an elegance to dunking that the world had never seen. And it's in the top dunkers today's game. Okay. You get a lot of their inspiration from those early days of MJ. When he got the ball in his hand, you expected something great to happen. And you knew once he got in the air, it was nothing anybody could do. You just sit there and watch. Probably the most charismatic dunker in history. deserving of the high score that he received, Steve. But Dominique Wilkins got the short end of a very impressive dunk. 92, Portland had its great season, and they were going into the finals against the Bulls, and Clyde Drexler had a great season. And there was a lot of talk that Clyde would be the MVP. Before the game, Michael says, we'll show who's the best player in the league. Drexler against Michael Jordan. This is a matchup that everybody wanted. One of the greatest moments in playoff history was Chicago Bulls versus Portland Trailblazers. And he hit so many threes that he looked to score a table and said, 
like, oh, I can't shoot? Okay, watch this. And he gets 35 points in the first half of game one against Drexler, including six three-pointers with his famous sort of shrug. There's Jordan for three! Yes! That was a tough series. We had to come back here in game six. You know, they were up, I think, 16, 17 points going into the fourth quarter. You know, Phil Jackson put our younger players in because we were energy guys. He knew that we were not gonna get blown out if we were in the game because of our energy level. Those fans can get you hyped very quickly and get you back in the game. You can be down 10 points and you don't have any energy. And all of a sudden you make a little run, hit a basket, and that crowd noise and that energy starts to feed because it seemed like the sound went straight from the floor all the way up to the ceiling. It's an explosion. We cut the lead down and the momentum had completely changed in that game. Portland starts to panic a little bit. That was remarkable because we won at home. You know, we won in front of our crowd. Michael Jordan, you know, it's hard, like, again, I hate comparison. Michael Jordan is, is another atmosphere. Yeah, we the last man standing. Always on point, we keep the cannon. Money flowing in, we got our mind right. OGs told me gotta keep the team tight. We the last men standing. Always on point, we keep the cannon. Money flowing in, I got my mind right. OGs told me gotta keep the team tight. Sick thoughts running through my forehead. When the drama is on, I want them all dead. Shootouts in the mall, I'm trying to take the city. From LA to Queens, I hope they fucking with me. I'm trying to get the cops on the payroll. Especially them pigs in the plain clothes. I do this for the people that don't got shit. I can feel their pain is real tragic. Grind to eat, I had no option. Shit start to click, I gotta pop it. Time to chill, I got a hard head. You gotta fall back if you want bread. My brother dead, I should've learned back then. But I'm still on point with the Mac 10. Start blasting if anybody make a move. I don't rock with the new dudes, I'm old school. We the last men standing, always on point, we keep the cannon, money flowing in, we got our mind right, OGs told me gotta keep the team tight, we the last men standing, always on point, we keep the cannon, money flowing in, I got my mind right, OGs told me gotta keep the team tight, yeah, we the last men standing, always on point, we keep the cannon. As the last of the first three-peat championships against Phoenix, we'd won two games out in Phoenix. We couldn't finish them off in Chicago. We had to go back to Phoenix. We're straggling out to the plane. On the plane strides Michael Jordan. Can of beer in his hand, big cigar. And he stopped and he looked around and he said, anyone that doesn't think we're gonna win the championship, get off the damn plane. And he was said, let's go boys. I didn't even pack for two games. Let's go out there and win this game and fly back tomorrow night. Here's Patterson to three. Pippen runs down the lane, dumps it out the horse. Because Jordan had so passionately embraced the team concept, the Bulls won three straight championships. Not only did they win, but now they're winning every year. This is an incredible departure for Chicago, that everybody in sports is looking toward Chicago as the model, as the team to be most feared, most respected, most admired, and most copied.
because there was excellence every night, because of the publicity that this team got during those years, propelled the league into something that it had never been before. In October of 93, just months after securing the Bulls' third title, North Carolina State investigator described the murder of James Jordan as something that could have happened to any one of us. But in this case, the shooting victim was the father of Chicago Bulls superstar Michael Jordan. He and James were alike, and they, they ran around together. They buddied up together. I have no doubt he was closer to James than anyone else in his life. And here's his best friend and his dad gets murdered. It brought on an onslaught of absurd media attention, people trying to link his father's death to the fact that he had gambled. Everything just sort of closed in on Michael. Number 23 told the world that all of his career goals had been met and there was nothing left to accomplish. When I lose the sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. I needed a change. Um, I, just, I just felt I was being engulfed by the success that I've gathered at that time. People were coming in and saying that this is clearly he was being driven from the league for other reasons, whether it was his gambling or something else. I laughed at the time. Two days after Jordan retired in October of 1993, Stern announced his four-month investigation had turned up no evidence that the Bulls star violated league rules. But it was too late. The following spring, Jordan tested himself in a new career. With his six-foot-six stature, not to mention his mammoth iconic status, Michael Jordan clearly stood out on the roster of the Birmingham Barons, the AA affiliate of the White Sox. In the spring of 1994, in honor of his late father, James, he traded in his charmed basketball life for the hard knock life of minor league baseball. I watched him play baseball, and we met afterward, and we you know, met in the bar, and then he came to my room. We talked for hours into the night. And I was just telling him, like, what a waste. Why would you give up being the best player in the game? Yeah, I've never been afraid to fail. You know, that's just something that, uh, you, know, you have to deal with in, in reality is that you're not always going to be successful and i think i'm strong enough as as a person to accept failure uh, you know but I, I will not accept not trying you know, that's something that I, I couldn't accept i think he took up a spot and a joy ride and a hobby that somebody who had a legitimate chance of playing in the big leagues might have taken he got paid to go to fantasy camp with the familiar pressure of a game on the line it was a new type of jordan shot that saved the day an RBI double as the spring training matchup would end in a 4-4 tie. How about that? But for Jordan, the cruelest reality wasn't the minor league bus rides, but the ongoing struggle to raise his game. With that, the baseball experiment was over about a year later. He knew people were going to get on him. His dad wanted to play baseball. And that's the reason. Not because Michael wanted to play it so much, but because his dad wanted him to give it a shot. He said, you know, I get up every morning, and I get in the car, and I look over, and my dad's there. And I think to myself, we're doing this, Pops. We're doing this together. We're going to get this done. And I think it was classic morning. His dad always did crossword puzzles. I looked up there one morning, and there he was doing a crossword puzzle. And I never saw him do one when his father was alive. Those minor leaguers were the best thing that happened to me. It was their true love for the game. And I lost that, and I found it again playing minor league baseball. Jordan's 1994 sabbatical with the White Sox farm system was an effort to honor his late father's wishes. But it was clear that a life in baseball would not amount to the winning formula he created on the court. Then came March 18, 1995, a day of celebration for Bulls fans, summed up with a statement containing only two words. I'm
he came back from baseball, all of a sudden you see him trying to get the best out of people. Now, instead of knocking somebody's confidence, he's trying to help them raise their confidence. 55.5 Michael Jordan. It kind of liberated him, but, you know, you really didn't know the effect of what it all meant until he won a championship on Father's Day. An emotional moment for Michael Jordan. The tears are flowing. That was a, the first time I realized that he wasn't there, you know, and you know, it was a very touching situation. It was very hard for me to deal with at that particular time. On or off the court, Jordan guarded his carefully tilled public image. He has an awful lot of clout. And I've heard from more than one person that if you step outside the bounds of, of how he wants you perceived, then, then the word will get to you. We wrote a story about him in Sports Illustrated when he was trying to play baseball. And I think the, the story was fairly sympathetic, but the, the cover was Baggett Michael. And he, to this day, will not talk to this magazine. Whenever Michael appears in public to come down from his hotel room, he is always dressed immaculately because he knows that there are people in the lobby that maybe are going to get a 20-second glimpse of Michael Jordan for once in their life. And he wants to portray a certain image and a certain class. I'm very image conscious, probably more than I should be, because I think it really prevents me, me from being the fun person that people behind closed doors know who I am. Jordan said, a lot of times, I'll dream I'm a bad alcoholic. And in the dream, I can't stop drinking, and I'm embarrassing myself, and I'm going to lose everything. He says, and I wake up from that dream in a sweat. He knows that one slip up, one mistake, can throw it all away. And I think he lived in terror of that for a very long time. To keep from living any part of that nightmare, Jordan enlisted the media in his efforts to stay balanced on the high wire. We protected him more than I'd like to admit. When his first child was born, uh, he hadn't been married uh, yet. He says to a couple of the beat writers, including me, I really would appreciate it if you didn't put that in the newspaper because we know he's had the baby it was Juanita, who's, you know, became his wife, and they were going to get married. And so I say, sure, Mike, I'm not, <laughs> we won't do it. And we don't. I mean, we just simply protect him because he asked us and because we were concerned as well about what the public reaction would be. Michael Jordan is the Teflon athlete of our generation. Everything just fell off of Jordan. You couldn't win any points in the media if you said or wrote something bad about him. People didn't want to hear that. You know, listen. I ain't gonna get on that. I'm not gonna be like everybody else and talk about, oh, what you did or didn't do when you went college. Forget all of that. Right. What I'm asking you is a simple question. We, we talk about the GOAT here, the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan, and you running your mouth talking about you're gonna be the one on one. Why would you say something so blasphemous? In my heyday, blasphemous. He would need help. Really? He's too really? small. His name is big, and y'all like, it was a 5 on 5. 5 on 5 game, he good. One on one, I'm undefeated, never lost. Will you stop it? Don't, Never lost one on one. That don't make any sense. D listen, ain't nobody really in heyday one on one. Why you saying something like that? That's took you the distance one on one. That's exactly. You look like you were tired. Hey, let me ask you this, like I tell him. You know, that's why you smiling right did now. Did I win or lose? Right. <laughs> did I win or lose? Right. All I care about is the W. I don't you care how I get it. You were tired from dancing, and you talking about you gonna beat Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan. How you gonna beat me? You know what? It's good. I gotta hear how you gonna beat me. Pick your poison. How's he gonna beat me? Why are you saying stuff like this? Tell me how's he gonna beat me. Why are you doing this? Well, you know, he's the greatest that's ever played. And he, you really, you, greatest who ever played. Yeah. You, you, you go right there. No, no question about it. And the thing that made Michael wow. so special, he did it on the highest level in the playoffs, like we've never seen before. So you and Larry saw things that you had not seen exactly.
Well, the best player I've played against uh, has to be Michael Jordan. 20 years ago tonight, Jason Kidd had a special night. It was the first time he faced Michael Jordan. Uh, George Story. Well, I think my first time guarding him. Do you remember that game? Yeah. Uh, my, probably my rookie year, uh, I actually told this story to uh, Chris Middleton. My rookie year, I'm guarding him. And I, I can just, you know, my heart's about to come out of my chest. And I was just a little nervous, and I think he could see that. So he came up to me and says, look, don't worry about it, kid. I like you, so I won't embarrass you tonight. So I said, oh, okay, great. I went to dinner the night before with Michael, and, uh, and I was just hoping when I left dinner that, um, that I didn't upset him. So I said, well, that was the embarrassment mean? 50? He said, oh, no, no, I'll take it easy on you. And so um, I was guarding him on the um, right box. I'm just praying that he just shoots a fadeaway jump shot. But he decided to go baseline. And, and he did a spin move to the baseline. And I said, oh, no, just don't dunk it. When he went to jump, all I could think about, this cannot be a highlight. Um, I think he picked up the check which might have upset him. <laughs> and then he jumped and he kept going and he went on the other side of the basket and did a little reverse layup. And I said, oh, thank you. I'm glad he didn't dunk it. And uh, he just did like a little reverse layup. And as he came down and started running back, he just looked back and winked at me. <laughs> and he looked back at me and winked at me and said, I told you I wasn't going to embarrass you. He took it easy on me. <laughs> and uh... <laughs> He had 35, so that was just a light embarrassment. <laughs> I, I thought, oh man, this could this could be a long night. <laughs> he did. He only had 36 points, and they won by six in overtime. But you didn't take it easy on him. Do you remember what you did? He's got a breakout. Tipped out to Kid. Jason Kidd. Kidd change of direction. Move off to Lorenzo yeah. Williams. No. 25, 15, 11, and six steals. Uh, none of those steals were against when I was guarding him. <laughs> uh, they must, we must have been playing on a lower basket for me to score that many points. Watch the move. Left hand, cross over to the right hand, cross back over to the left hand. Inside finds Lorenzo Williams, who dunks. My, oh, my. It was just, a, you know, playing against the best, you know, um, and I got lucky if those were my stats. Um, but, but we lost, so those, it, you know, it's about winning, and that's what he does best. I try to make the, the game uh, perfection. I try to make it a perfect game for myself. His way is to befriend them, to soften them up, uh, to try to feel, uh, make them feel like he cares about them. And then he goes out there and physically tries to destroy him. Van Gundy said that I was a con man, which I've never seen con man use in a, in a, um, in a polite or, or respectful way. For some reason, league-wide, it's important to be liked by him. I have no idea why. You take negative criticism in a, in, in a I'd take it in a positive way to go out and, and prove a point. I'm sure that uh, Michael will use this for motivation. Right around the screen, top of the circle jumper. MJ has really got it cooking. Makes a couple times, fades, fires. compete harder with my friends more so than with my enemies and uh, I don't think Magic Johnson laid aside and let me win a championship in 1991 because we were good friends. When you see me you know, maybe joking and kidding around with some of the players, sure I want to uh, create friends so that the stigma of Michael Jordan being such a dominant player and, and such a, a respected person that it doesn't infringe an individual coming up and being a friend to me. I want people to view me as a person, but yet, you know, when we step on the basketball court, I want them to challenge me as a basketball player. I just think Michael is going to be becoming a jump shooter, and I don't think he he, he, he puts himself in the, in the body situations where you can knock him around a little bit and be physical with him. For these criticism, I think a lot of times it's the motivation for their players uh, to give themselves up or raise their level of intensity towards me.
defense don't allow me to drive. You know, they give me the outside shot. If you look at most of the scouting reports in the league, a lot of teams will say, well, force him left, we'll make him take the outside jump shot. You know, by no means are they going to give me a direct lane to the basket. If so, I would go to the basket. You talk about motivation and, and finding different kinds of motivation. Well, it's not going to happen a lot where coaches are going to say these kind of statements to motivate you. Where else do you find the motivation? In the course of the game, uh, within myself, uh, challenging myself, you play a team that's not you know, above 500. It's a natural tendency to have a letdown. So the challenge is don't go with the natural tendency. Let's go opposite of the tendency. Or if you want to get individually, you know, I mean, maybe I get a triple-double. It's always something uh, somewhere I can find that challenge. And once I find it, then I'm in the floor of the game. I'm in the thought process of the game. Come on, I'll give you a jump shot right now. I'll give you a jump shot. Shoot. Oh, you don't want it. The game has evolved to be more of a mental challenge for me than a physical. You know, and that's one of the reasons that I still play the game, because I can challenge myself mentally. He was a more athletic version of Julius Irving. And he could shoot better than Julius Irving. And he was mean. He played defense. He won a spot on the all-defensive team for the seventh of nine times. And by adding a twisting fadeaway jumper to an offense that once relied on power and flight, Jordan, at 33, stood alone. It's almost like he allowed us to doubt him. Jordan and Pippen used to lock motherfuckers down. The thing about us is that we helped each other out. We always covered each other on the defense. And myself and Michael, we spent most of our careers trying to get steals and came away with quite a few of them, lost out on a few, but it was a, it was a challenge for us every game to go out and try to get steals, get easy baskets, and, uh, you know, we would look out for each other. We would have to cover each other's butt at times when we went for steals. Scotty hands to Mike. What a sensational feed to Pippen. Pippen asked Jordan, there's the feed. And you know, we've already gave ourselves names in the locker room. I'm doo-doo, he's sh**. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> Five on the 24. Here's Jordan. Did not have the shot. Five seconds remaining in regulation. The impact. a lot of nights you and Michael in close quarters and he's we a did. good talker. I mean, we did. What, so, what, so what would you hear from Michael? Uh, you know everything. I mean from Michael from I mean one time I know he started counting backwards. You know he said something like 38 and I didn't get it Reggie. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. he started saying 36. I said wait a minute wait a minute so he going backwards and now if he get to zero he got 40. But it was me and Michael has <laughs> a lot of talks. So. Phil you know titles that last season 97 98 the last dance and we're gonna do this last dance together. Those who were lucky enough to watch had a sense. Give me the ball for the last shot. I'll do it. It is my destiny to do it. I was made by God to take the last shot. Here's Jordan. Yes! Michael working on Russell. Brings them to within one. It was one of those games that it felt like we had control of the game. And I wish I had a nickel for every time you can say that about a team that Michael played on. Along his double, they swat at it and steal it. You get right to the last second. He had the ball in that situation. Here comes Chicago. 17 seconds. Jordan. Open. Chicago with the lead. He loves to compete and rise to that moment that is presented to him. And I think he seeks that moment. Stopped it. Harper's on it. Behind the screen. Michael 
and the Chicago Bulls are why the NBA became a global. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship. Six titles, six finals MVPs. That means it was all about you each series. You were the mismatch. Trademark gym shoes, still top sellers to this day. Ball head, tongue wag. Ooh, look at that fucking thing that looked like a lizard. There's three guys that anytime I see them, I pay homage to. Uh, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, who saved the NBA and took it to an incredible level. And, and Michael Jordan, jab steps, everything was perfect. He was the, and the perfect size. Yeah, you, you said it right, perfect size. to add what Chuck said and to you guys, and being a two guard, Chuck and Kenny, you, you watch guys, and you all know, what can I take away? What's my advantage tonight? And, and that's when I start racking my brain, <laughs> night in and night out, because I'm saying, hey, am I going to take, especially when you start shooting threes. And, and am I going to let him shoot jumpers? Couldn't do that. Yeah. I, I, am I going to make him put it in his left hand? There was always a player that there was a weakness. I couldn't find anything, so you start to say, I got to get him in foul trouble. And all the refs out there, every time we play, Chuck, I end up with five fouls, he end up with one. <laughs> so there was, there was nothing you could really do other than I tried to beat him up on the post. And hopefully, you know, that'll be my answer. But one of the greatest ever and a nightmare to prepare for. Four years ago, he told a Hall of Fame crowd not to laugh, but don't be surprised if he steps back on the court when he's 50. No, Michael Jordan isn't suiting up for his team he owns. If he was, we wouldn't be doing this in the C block. It'd right. be our top story in the A's. But he has an edge over his own players, those Bobcats. Now, earlier this year, the second overall pick, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, admitted MJ schooled him one-on-one. -on -one. Well, of course he did. That's a lot of knowledge there, yeah. a lot of skills. That never goes away, right? And uh, do you think if you play against some of your guys right now, did you do you sometimes do that or not? Or could you win on one-on-ones against them? Or? I'm pretty sure I can, so I don't want to do that and de demolish their confidence, so I stay away from them. I let them think they're good. They think that they are good, and but I'm too old to do that anyway. MJ sat down with the game's creators to discuss all manner of all things basketball. You got to be very competitive. You know, I think a lot of my defense is because of my competitive nature is that I don't want you to outscore me, you know, or I don't want you to score a certain number of points on me. Are there rules to talking trash? I only talk trash to people that I knew, my friends, Patrick Ewing, Bird, Magic, those type of guys. But um, I never talk trash to people that I didn't know or people I'm just meeting. And if they did, my game always did my talking. I never say anything. So this can be something you probably, you probably could print. You know, I'm playing in my, uh, my camp against O.J. Mayo. He was a top high school kid coming out. And I didn't, I never met him first time. In front of my camp, he starts this thing about, uh, you can't guard me, you can't do this. You know, I got my campers here, so I obviously I can't really go where I want to go because of my camp. So I stop the camp, send the kids to, to bed. We go back to playing. And he starts this whole thing, you know, that you can't guard me, you can't do this. And then finally I just let him, I said, look, dude, you, you, you may be the best high school player, but I'm the best player in the world. So from this point on, it's a lesson. And from that point on, it was a lesson. He never won a game. I posted him up. I did everything. If I can ever show you that film, and if you can ever ask him that, ask him about the thing that happened at my camp. I don't consider that trash. I consider that fact. <laughs> you call it trash. <laughs> I got a few buckets, in the, and I think the, uh, the campers knew I was the only high school kid, and so uh, they got rowdy a little bit, and uh, we got a little bit of John, and so, uh, you know, we played two games. I think we, uh, we split one-on-one. -on -one. It was team game, and then uh, he said, okay, now let me handle my business. So he was jawing a little bit and uh, really getting into me defensively, and, uh, uh, you know, he's backing me down, you know, said, better scream for mama, you know, he's mama, mama, you know, hit the... Hit the famous fadeaway on me, and you know, uh, Mike was Mike. <laughs> Finally, I just said, I said, look, dude, you, you, you may be the best high school player. You know, but I'm the greatest ever. And uh, don't you ever disrespect, you know, the great like that. 50 years down the line, you can start 
this because we'll be the old school artist. Since coming in the league, LeBron has been chasing the ghost of Michael Jordan as the GOAT. James had some interesting comments on the subject when he joined the Open Run podcast on the Uninterrupted Podcast Network. I don't think MJ ever had a game seven in the finals. And people say, well, he was able to close it out early, you know, and they act like he just, you know, did it all on his own yeah. and things of that yeah. nature. They yeah. they forget the the shot by Pax and mm -hmm. on the left wing, mm -hmm. you know. I got burned by Bill Winnington a bunch yeah. of times. You know, you know, you, okay? you want to know the crazy thing <laughs> in that <laughs> game, in that particular game in Phoenix, MJ didn't even have a ball in his hands. Pippen brought the ball up. Barkley went for the steal. Pippen threw it down to Horace Grant and they got the defense, you know, because mm -hmm. Barkley went for Downward. the gamble. They they yeah, rotated sure. to Horace Grant and Horace Grant threw it to Pax and MJ just had nothing. This the other day, MJ yeah. had nothing to do with that play. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Smith, the floor is yours, my friend. You know, I'm going to try to 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 keep myself under control because I don't want to find myself in a position where I get too out there. I got emotional about Melo because I'm a diehard Knicks fan. I don't want to get too emotional because I'm an MJ fan. But LeBron James, what the hell are you doing? Now, I understand. Let me be very, very clear. LeBron is a three-time champion. LeBron is the greatest player in the world. I am sick and tired of throwing out qualifiers about how great he is and how he's the closest thing to perfection as a professional athlete in terms of on the court, off the court combination. Look, I, I mean, enough of the praise. We, we Listen, I love LeBron James. I, I love what he means to the game. I love him as a person. I think he's a great guy. But this kind of stuff right here, Max Kellerman, is sacrilegious, it is blasphemous, it is disrespectful, and I have to say this. Scottie Pippen was a Hall of Famer. Is that not recognition? I think that's recognition. If you have a teammate who is a Hall of Famer, when we show highlights of the Chicago Bulls winning championships, did we not show John Paxson shooting the jump shot? Did we not show Steve Kerr hitting jump shots? Of course we did, LeBron James. What we're talking about here is arguably the greatest player who ever lived, really indisputable to most of us, six NBA Finals, six NBA Championships, six NBA Finals MVPs without ever allowing a Game 7. Of course Jordan didn't defend five people by himself. Of course he didn't score 100-plus points in each game. Of course he had teammates. So all of this stuff that LeBron James is saying, really makes no sense. It just smacks in the face of respect because when you are great, the reason why Michael Jordan was so great was not only because he was clutch, not only because he was a closer, but before he was a closer in terms of championships, Max Kellerman, he was a killer and you knew it. Larry Bird said God in, in, a, in, a bat, in, in shorts waxed us when Michael Jordan dropped 63. So when LeBron James becomes suddenly, you know, professorial, you know, and, and starts waxing eloquently about the nuances of basketball. This is exactly the kind of thing that led to the damn fourth finals losses. Because what I'm not all for, because we know that two of them really were not his fault at all. But the point that I'm trying to make is if LeBron James had Michael Jordan's attitude. Do they lose to Dallas? Can J.J. Barea guard him in the finals? Can Jason Terry not a guard chance. him no. in the finals? No. no, it does not happen. No. It does not happen. So when we're talking about Michael Jordan, of course he had teammates. Of course he played with people. Of course, you know, other guys contributed and got it done. Of course, unlike LeBron James, Michael Jordan had one specific coach he could rely upon throughout those six titles because Phil Jackson was consistently his coach, whereas LeBron James had obstacles to climb, etc., etc. It just baffles my mind, Max Kellerman. Why you're LeBron James and you would utter these words because in the end, it doesn't matter how you slice it. I know he went out of his way to express that he meant no disrespect to Michael Jordan, and I get that. And in his heart of heart, I don't think he meant disrespect, but your words 
come across as at the very least lacking a true appreciation and being a bit duplicitous because when you are a superstar and you are the man, you know what the hell we're talking about. Don't act like you don't know what the requirements are that come along with that. LeBron James, God bless him because good, thank the good Lord, he is the man in the NBA because he makes my days better throughout the season. But you know better than making the kind of statement that he made. This is some blasphemous stuff here. You know, my, LeBron James is really into advanced stats, into advanced metrics, using them to make his game better, to make it more efficient. He did it in Miami. He continues to do so. I mean, he uses these stats that were not available to Michael Jordan, even had Jordan been interested in those stats. So he has the advantage there in terms of how efficient he can be. And yet, according to all the most advanced metrics, Michael Jordan is greater on average in his career, like his PER, his average PER, is higher than LeBron's. Wait a minute. That includes those seasons where he declined in Washington. LeBron hasn't even hit that phase yet. So that gap between Jordan on top and LeBron too is only going to widen. But here is the reason I wanted to interject. Because while you're waxing so eloquently about these metrics and everything else, and you are on point, your biggest point is what, something I want my audience to gravitate to, Max Kellerman. And that is this. He's sort of tugging away at Jordan because you're justifying yourself. Your three and four record in the NBA Finals. I'm here to tell you right now, two of those losses shouldn't be It's counted. really three and two. The, two we agree. It's exactly. three and two. It's really it's three, and, three two. and two to yeah. me. It shouldn't be three and four. LeBron James really should be three and two to me. I don't blame him for two of those Finals losses. But I would also like to add something here that I haven't heard anybody say. Does Michael Jordan... Jordan with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh lose to the Dallas Mavericks? No. Hell no. That ain't no, happening. It just doesn't I happen. can promise you no, that. It doesn't happen. Does Michael Jordan with Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade lose to San Antonio that second no. go round? I don't believe so. I recall Michael Jordan and them going against Utah. Okay? Didn't happen when you face Carl Malone and John Stockton second time around. Try same getting result. to a seventh game okay. first. Same, same result. The problem is, is that now you're tugging at Jordan's cape and you're not apologizing for it because even though you're doing it, you won't admit that you're doing it, but none of us are fools. That's exactly what you're trying to do. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work, LeBron. You can't sit up there. Look, LeBron James played with a bunch of no-names when he went to the finals, the first go-round with Cleveland against San Antonio. We understand all of that. We get the part that you got to have teammates to win. But when you bring it up, in this particular instance, for Michael Jordan, what in God's name would be the perfect, the, the purpose for going on a damn podcast to talk about how, you know, Michael Jordan had teammates. The I question, mean, Steve Kershaw. I mean, John Paxson shot the ball. Oh, what, 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 for what? I find it offensive, disrespectful. I find it downright shameful that LeBron James continues to even bring up Michael Jordan in the same breath with LeBron James. So I ask you, is there a way that he will ultimately be able to chase the ghost of 23? Wow. How? Wow. I'm asking. He's lost, a, he's lost multiple finals. Jordan is 66. Jordan has never come up short, you know, in, in a series like he did back in uh, the, the Dallas series uh, finals. Uh, how can you surpass that? When he's six to six. See, that's, that's the part that wins me over. There was an invincibility about Michael in the, the last eight years of his career. And as great as LeBron is, the, the losses and the ah! final, look at that. There's no invincibility. You don't, I don't know that he changed the game. Michael didn't just change basketball, he changed sports globally. Again, and LeBron is the best player we've got now. He's a great, great player in any era. I think he's going to retire as one of the five to eight best players who ever played the game, if not higher. But catching Jordan, to me, is just something I can't wrap my head around. I ask you, did Michael Jordan ever disappear in any round of the playoffs, even when he was trying to fight through the Detroit Bad Boy Pistons and Larry Bird's Boston Celtics? Did he ever just disappear? Did anybody ever say... Boy, Michael Jordan had a bad series against the Celtics. Nobody ever said that. The chosen one turned into the frozen one in ways I have never seen a superstar shrink on the national stage. I've never seen 
a mentally weaker superstar in the history of in all my time of watching sports. Gone to the final six times, six finals MVP, period. Never lost in the finals. I never knew what it felt like. And it's the killer instinct that MJ had. I think LeBron's more of a pleaser, and he wants to get everyone involved, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're looking at the numbers alone, you could make a case. And if Mike and didn't, if Mike didn't take that vacation to baseball, would he have gone eight for eight? Well, I'll put it to you like this: name. And we talked about this. Name all the guys that he denied Hall of Famers that he's denied championships. <laughs> Myself, Ewing, Cole, John, yep. Ewing, Chuck, <laughs> Charles. All the guys that he denied championships. And you might want to throw in Hakeem Olajuwon if he's not batting a buck 97 and missing fly balls in the outfield. Hakeem Olajuwon may not have two. Man, he could have gone eight for eight. In 2014, my San Antonio Spurs blew LeBron James' heat off the floor by a record finals margin. And I ask you, Shannon Sharp. Did Michael Jordan ever get blown off the floor, his team, by any record margin in any round of the playoffs? No. Sorry, LeBron, you're disqualified from even bringing up Michael Jordan. I agree with you, but one of the things I hate about framing these arguments is we forget that this is a team game. And so because of that, Michael Jordan did have Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman and Phil Jackson. And the reason why LeBron won't even be in this conversation is because he did have to leave Cleveland, where he was the MVP and the leader, to go to Miami right. to achieve championship glory. Here, right. six times and win six finals. But, he, but even when he got to, to, to Miami and he did have other Hall of Famers on the team, he didn't go four for four. No. He went two for four. So, you know, that, that, that that's a good argument as well, but there's no way that he can catch Michael Jordan. I mean, LeBron is, I agree with you, going to go down between top five or six players in the history of the game. No way he can catch number one. Blind witnesses who worship LeBron James, you raise your hand. I know you're one of the, <laughs> you're one of the masses. Yes. I was going to include you in that. Okay. They have expunged from LeBron's record all those things. They, they don't count anymore. They're swept under the carpet and into the graveyard as if they never happened. They happened. You can't take them off his legacy. LeBron James is a great player. He's a great player in this era, but he's not Michael Jordan. Um, you know, it's two different animals. Uh, Michael was was a killer. He's an assassin. Uh, you know, Le LeBron is more of a uh, of a facilitator. He's you know, he's he's the, the guy that you're gonna give the ball and he's gonna he's probably he's thinking shoot first before pass. Where Michael, you give him the ball, he's thinking he's gonna score fifty on you, and then he's gonna pass. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, um, you, you know, and, and, my, and Michael Jordan was the best player, the greatest player in my era. Uh, there's been a lot of great players in this league. And it's hard to, you know, to give one player that best ever uh, crown. But all I can say is in my era, Michael Jordan was the best player in my era. And he's, uh, I mean, I haven't seen anybody else. Kobe is, I guess, the closest, came the closest to him. But LeBron is great, but he's not Michael Jordan. But I don't think he needs seven. to be compared to Michael. Michael was much better offensively with a low post game, with his shooting. He never played on a team where anybody on the court got double teamed but him. These two guys he, he played, played with Shaq. No, Kobe's played with Shaq. That's what he's saying. Who got double teamed. He's playing with Dwayne Wade. Michael never played with a player that would get double teamed. So you had to carry that offensive load for an entire career, not just a season, an entire career, and then on the other end be first team all defensive play. There's no one going to ever be like that because they won't. None of these guys, as we talked about earlier, about these super teams, nobody will ever have that burden put on them that Michael Jordan had the way things are being constructed. Greatest clutch shooter or player ever versus one who's, whose weakness has always been the clutch moments. When people start comparing him with, like, with Jordan, then that's not a fair comparison. Because, you know, that's, you know Jordan's far more superior player mm. and a very, very tough league. And very, very, you know, uh, create, you know, very creative. Sure. I mean, that's not taking away anything away from LeBron James, who is a great player. But it's not a fair comparison because I think Jordan is much faster to be a player. But when you want to talk about legacy and you want to try to convince me that he's even in the same breath with Michael Jordan, 
That is incomprehensible and finally just shamefully offensive to me. And I, I this conversation's over. I think I'm going to leave now. I feel confident because I'm the best player in the world. That's simple. What? You think there's someone else? Proof. Wow. Look at the air. Look at the air. People always debate it. Who's the greatest player of all time? Dumb question. It should be, who's the greatest team of all time? You know, there are so many teams to choose from. The 91 Chicago Bulls, sorry Showtime. The 92 Bulls, back to back. 93 Bulls, first three peat. 97 Bulls, even with the flu. 98 Bulls, no push off. And my favorite, the 96 Chicago Bulls. 72 wins, tough to beat that. LeBron James never has, nor, never, nor will he ever be, Michael Jordan. LeBron is great, but Michael Jordan is the greatest. And even in that time, I'll say a rhyme. Of We all say, this is the guy, he's the best. And uh, we say it with great pride and we say it with great honor uh, to have played and competed against him. It was really uh, fun to play against him. He was so competitive and uh, nobody wants to win more than that guy. We're taking a look back at the times when Michael scored 50 points or more in the NBA. He did it a stunning 39 times, eight times in the playoffs. Isaiah's already praised Michael to the heavens. One more quick one from you, Magic, then back to Isaiah. Do you feel that Michael is the best ever? I think so. I think he's the not only the best basketball player, but probably the greatest athlete that's ever played any sport. He is the best ever. Jordan created the blueprint for greatness and all shooting guards. Did you know that the Jordan Bulls never lost three consecutive games from 1990 until after he retired? He currently holds the record for most points in a single playoff game with 63 and has eight 50 plus point playoff performances, four more than anyone else. Let's see what else his Aaroness did. Six championships, six finals MVPs, five regular season MVPs, 10 scoring titles, number one all-time in points per game for the playoffs, number one all-time in points per game for the regular season, number one in PER for the regular season and the playoffs, number one in win shares for the playoffs, number four in win shares for the regular season, and number four all-time scoring. Be it his serious clinching buzzer beater over Craig Elo, his 63-point dismantling of the Celtics, the flu game, the up and under, the 96 comeback championship, or MJ's farewell cross-up of Byron Russell, there has been no player that has provided us more legendary performances than Michael Jordan. And I also think that uh, I had to give praise to another guy in Larry Bird. He was the probably the most fierce competitor that I've ever faced. Bird in the corner. Larry, little runner. Gets the bounce. Trying to roll away. Blocked by Jordan. Rolls up by three. Bird cuts it to two points. Jordan, giving Paxson all the head fakes. Hits the little jump. Larry over the head to Paris for two. Had to cope with those quick passes. Michael Jordan knocks it down. Fred Roberts. Burn on the tip of the buzzer. About the foul situation, except on Michael Jordan. Bird with the left-handed runner. Jordan will just fire deep and hit. Oh. Larry, quick fake. Left-handed off the glass. Pippen be a pinball, you know, bouncing off the rails. <laughs> and there he is. He can't hold his feet. But Bird is forced to his left hand. I mean... Michael inside. Charges to the boards. Bird around a screen for two. Like it might be one of those get out of Michael's way. Larry knocks it down and gets a foul. As Sellers got there late. Sellers, good roll to Jordan. Got it. A foul. Basketball team with Sam Vincent in there. Bird with two more. 
Jordan, left-handed. Inside Bird, good fake. Trying to get a step, nowhere to go. Comes up short. Look at the follow. Harris, Porzine, battle for it. Bird, the steal. Get two. Jordan at the buzzer for two. Celtics are four on two. Now the Bulls catch up. Larry. Jordan. Literally had him wrapped around the race. Hits the bucket. The foul called off the ball. Michael Jordan. For two. Larry gets free. Gets two. Shoot him to the left. And... Oh, oh, what a pass by Jordan. Bird lost him on a screen. Hits the jumper. Jordan pops out. Goes baseline. Hits a tough shot. Larry rolling through. Tough shot. Yeah, and a foul. Heard it, a three-point shooter in the lineup. Bird comes around the screen. Fire. Oh, Jordan got free. Got the reverse layup. Larry, wide open in the corner. 44 for Bird. We, we only dream about doing things that he can do, and that being Isaiah and myself. You know, no offense to anyone. There's a lot of tremendous athletes out there, but I haven't seen anyone personally that works as hard as Michael that expects to win and be the best at the same time. That guy devoured anything on a basketball court, loved practice, won every drill, won every game, won every scrimmage. Jordan passed Petrovic. Whoa! Oh, yes, yes, yes. Failure was not an option for him. He was so uh, great to watch play basketball. It was a new look at basketball at that time. And of course, the rest of the world caught on to his uh, superiority as a basketball player. So he was really an ambassador for the game. Maybe now that he's 50 years old, he can sit back and say, you know what? Not only did I play pretty well, I might have been the greatest player that's ever played. During that time, never thought that. He was always trying to prove something to somebody. I think Michael has uh, you know, as good a legacy as anybody who's played any sport. Uh, because he loved the game, had a passion for it, played it at the highest level, won at the highest level a number of times, committed himself to the game in, in the Olympics and in his country, and continues to commit to teaching the game. You can't play this game of basketball and not know who Michael Jordan is, who Michael Jordan was, and what Michael Jordan meant to this league. In a made-for-TV event, Jordan's number was retired, and a statue of the living legend was unveiled in front of the new United Center, affectionately known as the house that Jordan built. MJ did it all in his career. An NCAA title, Rookie of the Year, two gold medals, and six NBA championships. But it doesn't end there. Add five regular season MVPs, six finals most valuable players, and ten scoring titles, the most in NBA history. In his career with the Bulls, he won 10 scoring titles, including seven straight, and had the highest career average in league history, 32 points. In the end, what it comes down to, when we've watched Jordan, who religiously averaged over 30, who was an all-defensive player, who was a leading scorer, who did this, who did that, Michael Jordan came into the league, and from the moment he arrived, he put the world on notice. In 2009 came the ultimate honor as a Basketball Hall of Fame inductee in purchasing the Charlotte Bobcats in 2010. Jordan became a team owner, and as Michael Jordan celebrates 50 years of life, the images of his work will always be vintage and timeless. I think that uh, we all can, uh, can really sit back now and really realize that uh, it was so great to be alive and covering basketball during Michael Jordan's time. We will always remember him as, uh, to me, the best player to ever play the, the game. One day you might look up and see me playing the game at 50. <laughs> oh, don't laugh. Don't laugh. 
Never say never, because limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. Thank you very much. Michael J. Jordan. Powered by a drive to compete that earned him every major award in basketball, including six NBA championships, five Most Valuable Player awards, and two gold medals, Michael Jordan has a name that's become a synonym for excellence. His wagging tongue and high-flying dunks redefined the game, making him a global superstar whose impact transcended basketball and shaped our nation's broader culture. From the courts in Wilmington, Chapel Hill, and Chicago, to the owner's suite he occupies today, his life and example have inspired millions of Americans to strive to be like Mike. In the end, it's clear, Jordan is the GOAT. That's all, folks. Well, that's my line.